Uh, welcome to lesson 25 on flow control valves of the course on industrial automation. Flow control valves are very important. So, after learning the lesson, the student should be able to describe the importance of flow control valves. They are found everywhere in process industries. Learn the structure of major types of flow control valves. Learn about the their flow characteristics because that is very important in uh, designing the applications. And finally, the how to actuate these valves and how to affect their characteristics to achieve a certain uh, characteristic of the process control loop. So these are the topics that the student is expected to learn from this lesson. So the first of all, let us have a look at the importance of flow control. Flow control is probably the most important control in, uh, in a process control application and as we shall see during our process control module that flow control loops form a part of most type of control loops. For example, they are parts of flow loops where directly flow has to be controlled, flow is the final objective of control. They are parts of temperature loops because temperature is generally controlled by controlling flow of either a coolant or and let us say steam for heating. This is not stream, this is steam. Of, of course, for level loops because by integrating flow only you have level. So, all level control is essentially flow control. Similarly, pressure loops because again pressure control is <coughs> achieved by using flow control and composition loops because compositions of products are typically dependent on the uh, compositions of the components in a let us say a reactor. So, if you want to control the composition of a particular product, flow control is often a very important part of that uh, control application. So, we see that for most types of control applications, flow control is a part and the element that finally achieves the control is the flow control valve. So, it is so its importance cannot be overstated and uh, as we shall as we need to uh, mention again slight spelling mistake. So, uh, this is a valve flow is actually a function of valve uh, uh, the pressure drop across the valve and this uh, and the stem position as we shall as we perhaps know that <coughs> by uh, Bernoulli's equation the flow of a <coughs> flow through a through an orifice a flow control valve is is essential in orifice and it is the dimensions of the orifice which are varied is proportional to uh, proportional to a root over of delta p, delta p is the pressure difference across the valve and k is a proportionality constant which contains among other things a uh, what we what we call a discharge coefficient or Cv. So, the flow con the in flow control valves it is this k or this discharge coefficient of the valve which is changed by changing the orifice dimensions. So, that is the way we achieve flow control. <coughs> now, uh, so first of all we see the various kinds of valves and the first kind of valves that we see are globe valves. Globe valves are so before we we must understand the various parts. So, I am going to hatch it. So, this is the these are the ports. This particular flow control valve, this is inlet port, this is outlet port. This is another 
component of the body Not this one, not I'm sorry, not this one, not this one. This this part, this part. This is the body right. So the fluid <coughs> in fact there are this is a this is a top and bottom guided, top and bottom guided means the, the, the basic valve assembly movement is guided and in the top and at the bottom and it is a double seated globe valve. So there are two seats, one seat is here, another seat is here. So actually the fluid enters through this and will go through this uh, uh, when this valve will rise when this valve will rise it will go through this and will flow out similarly it will go through this it will go through this path and go out so since there are two seats it's it's a it's a it's a double seated globe valve one of the advantages of double seating is that the force <coughs> as you can see that the fluid when it flows through the valve it actually exerts a, a pressure on uh, this, this, this valve mechanism. This is called the stem and these are called the plugs. These are the plugs so the plugs actually come and this is, this, this is the seat and the plug actually comes and sits over the seat and seals the seals the orifice and when the valve opens this plug goes up so the fluid flows through the orifice and this plug movement is is uh, actually realized by moving the stem to which the plug is connected so obviously there is the fluid exerts force on the plug and the plug sometimes has to work against this force so to reduce for double seated valves although they are not so popular nowadays but double seated valves one of the biggest advantages of double seated valves is that since the force when the liquid is flowing in this direction <coughs> and the force that the liquid exerts in this direction are opposing each other so the net force on the on the on the stem is actually small so therefore it requires a a smaller capacity of the actuator to 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 make a movement but still nevertheless these valves are not so popular because of mainly two reasons firstly that single seated valves are can be realized with a much smaller size <coughs> number one and number two is that because of you know slight mechanical uh, problems it, 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 it is very difficult to ensure that both the plugs actually seal seal the uh, seal the orifice at, at the same time and therefore often you have problems of leaking through the valve the, the, the shut off of the valve is not so tight so it is for this reason that people nowadays prefer uh, single seated valves so this is a single seated valve you know you this is the plug this is the plug you can see that this is the seat on which the plug sits this is the seat this is the stem this is the, these are the bodies this is the body so the fluid actually flows like this like this like this so this is the fluid path when the valve opens <coughs> so this is the inlet port inlet and this is the outlet port so this is a top entry top entry because the valve stem enters from the top top guided here there's only one guidance one guiding piece that is top guided not not top and bottom guided 
single seated because there is only one seat globe valve. So, <coughs> these valves are one of the most common types of valves used in the process industry. Next are ball valves. These valves have the, in the previous case the, the stem actually moves in a linear fashion up and down is for these valves the stem actually rotates. So, it is a so it requires a rotary actuator it can be directly coupled to a motor. So, you see that actually you have a ball a ball like structure through which there is a hole. <coughs> so, you can see the hole this is the, this, this is the ball these are ball valves and this is the hole through the this is the hole through the ball. So, now suppose so this is the hole suppose so when the ball is in this position then you can understand that this is the the inlet port and this is the outlet port. So, when the when suppose the fluid is coming like this is the inlet port and this is the outlet port. So, when the hole is aligned with the inlet port and outlet port holes then the fluid can flow from inlet to outlet. On the other hand if the ball rotates then the flow is blocked. So, it is by rotating the ball that various amounts of flows can be realized right. So, <coughs> this is the basic principle of a ball valve. For example, this is a multipore ball valve. So you can see the ball. This is a this is a cross section. So the ball is you know like this, semi-cylindrical, ellipsoidal, and these are the holes. So the, in this case, this has this can take care of three ports. So you can see that in various positions of the ball, if the ball is aligned like this, then liquid can flow from here to here. If it is aligned this way, it can flow from this to this or this to this. So, under the various positions of the ball valve you can have <coughs> various kinds of various ports can be connected to various others right. This is a T ported ball valve you can have an angle ported ball, ball valve and things like that. So, this is the basic principle of ball valves. <coughs> this is this picture shows how when a when a when a ball valve rotates then how the flow throttling takes place. So, you see that as as it is as it is rotating as it is rotating. So, this the the effective area of flow be, gets reduced. So, as it rotates slowly the effective area of flow will get reduced and therefore, the flow will get reduced. So, the flow gets throttled. <coughs> this is another kinds of ball valve where the where the where the ball is of a certain shape. So, it is called a characterized ball valve. So, here you, you can see that as again as it rotates this this surface <coughs> slowly comes and closes the flow and therefore, the flow is flow can be throttled or it can be completely shut off. <coughs> so, these are this is another kind of ball valve called the characterized ball valves. <coughs> the third kind of valve actually there are various kinds of valves we are going to only talk about some major ones, but there are at least 10 15 different types of valves which are which are used in various uh, kinds of applications in the industry diaphragm valve pinch valve uh, sliding gate valve etc etc so this is another kind of valve which is called a butterfly valve so basic idea is that this is butterfly valves are used in large pipes they are they are also used for they are ap apart from you know uh, ap applications in let us say uh, liquid applications like uh, water, water flow control, etc. They are they are also used in uh, gas applications like they are used in uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning applications of large buildings where the air flow needs to be controlled. So in such applications, butterfly valves are also used. <coughs> so basic idea is that in all valves there has to be an there has to be a variable obstruction, right? So it is this this disc, this disc which is the which creates the obstruction and, and there is a there is a shaft or a pin 
about which so you can understand that you can understand that this is this this is the butterfly valve and there is basically a shaft runs across it and this shaft is driven so this this valve is actually <coughs> this valve is actually uh, stuck to this and if you if, if if you rotate this actuator then this valve can be either in this position or in this position so if you have a pipe here if you have a pipe here then if you connect it in this position then it's open if you connect it this position if you put it in this position then it's closed right <coughs> so exactly that is the that is the position so the, the these these two positions are shown so this is the open position of the <coughs> of the disk open position and this is the closed position of the disk both positions are shown closed position and this is the shaft or pin which is driven to to move the disk various shapes of disks are used to to you know again to reduce the torque requirement on the shaft or to reduce noise so these such big disks when you have a fast flowing fluid can can sometimes vibrate and create noise so uh, so this is this is a picture which shows that so look from a side when the when the disc is in this position then the damper or uh, then the damper is perpendicular to flow and the valve is closed when it is moving then it's throttling or controlling the flow and when it is in this position then when damper is parallel to flow then it's completely open <coughs> So there are various kinds of disc which are used as I said to take care of various factors like torque and noise. Now we, so we have seen three different types of valves characterized in terms of construction, right. Now we shall characterize valves in, in another way depending on their flow characteristics. So depending on their flow characteristics, valve can, valve can be generally characterized in into three different classes. One is, <coughs> I mean, butterfly valves are typically of equal percentage uh, type. So that's why and butterfly was written. So one is this equal percentage. So another is linear, and the third one is quick opening. So this equal percentage valve is you can see equal percentage means that if you if you have a this is percent lift, percent lift means the stem if it is lifted by a certain percentage, this, the stem is moving. So, so percent lift or, or percent stem position, this, this it may not be though it is called lift, it, it may not be always a lift, you know sometimes it may be a rotation also. Basically means that the percent of the total st stem movement, <coughs> so it says that if you increase the stem movement by x percent then y percent the of the current flow will in, so the flow will increase by y percent of the current flow right so if you make x percent change <coughs> if you make a delta x x percent of full scale so if you make a 20 percent change here then maybe 5 percent of the current flow which is here will take place. On the other hand, if you make a 20 percent change here, <coughs> then 5 percent of the current flow which is here will take place. If you make 20 percent change here, then 5 percent of the current flow which is here will take place. So you see that for the same 20 percent change at 20 percent, 40 percent, 60 percent, 80 percent, <coughs> the change in flow is going to gradually increase, right, giving rise to this characteristics. So an equal percentage of the current flow will take place if you make a certain, a certain fixed percentage of lift change. That is, the, that is the reason why these valves are called equal percentage. So you can easily analyze, <coughs> you can easily understand that this sort of a characteristic exponential kind of characteristic arises. So uh, on the other hand we have linear which is obvious that is for a certain percent of 
lift change, a certain fixed percentage of the total full scale change, not current flow will take place. So, it is a linear, it is guided by constant. Actually, the linear and the equal percentage are mostly used in process applications. Quick opening valves are you know like our like our bathroom taps are, <coughs> are typically quick opening. So, you must have seen that <coughs> if you the almost full flow is realized by a maybe even one turn or one and a half turns of the tap while if you move it more and more then not much flow increase takes place. So, these valves there is a quick <coughs> increase of flow and then for the rest of the movement there is very little flow. So, it is kind of opposite of the equal percentage and they are typically used more in you know uh, on off kind of applications or, or some certain special kinds of process control applications, but, but most of the control applications <coughs> use linear and equal percentage valves. Remember one thing that these characteristics have assumed that these characteristics are called inherent characteristics and are provided by the manufacturer, inherent characteristics of the valve and are provided by the manufacturer under conditions that the, that the pressure across the valve is constant. So, they actually maintain the pressure across the valve and then they characterize this curve, right. So, this is important to understand and <coughs> now, how are these characteristics realized? They are realized by various profiles of the plug, right. So, in the case of the globe valve here, say we have there are three kinds of these are three plugs which realize equal percentage linear or quick opening characteristics. Now, it turns out one must realize that if you actually put the valve into an application and connect it up with you know other components, pumps, systems, pipes, etcetera, then the inherent characteristic will not be realized. So, the pressure flow characteristic of the of the <coughs> actually the rather the stem lift versus uh, versus flow characteristic of the valve which is provided by the manufacturer which is the inherent characteristic will not be realized because of the fact that delta p will not remain constant. So, how does that happen? So, you see that when you <coughs> when you are connecting, so this goes to the system wherever you want to send this flow and we are just you know arbitrarily assuming that the head of the that the system takes a particular kind of static head. So, what happens is that during flow there are actually pressure drops. So, there is there is some pressure drop at the inlet of the pump, then the pump raises the pressure that is the job of the pump, it creates a pressure head. Then this <coughs> flows through the pipe, so again there is some friction loss and there is some pressure head. Then there is a drop across the valve because all because all valves will have a you know if it has to flow through an orifice there has to be a delta p. Then again there is a drop ac along the pipe and then the available pressure at the system is there. So, this is the way the pressure drops and actually as we shall see now <coughs> that now as now as we know that these pressure various pressure drops vary uh, vary with flow itself. So, for example, the the pipe friction pressure loss will also rise with flow. Similarly, if the the pump head because there there are pressure pressure losses inside the pump. So, the pump head available the pump head that will be generated will also be uh, will also be lower. Similarly, here we have assumed a static head pressure, it may be constant or in some cases even this for example, if the if the if the fluid is a you know kind of heat exchanger then again the heat exchanger is actually nothing but a nothing but a intertwined length of pipe. So, basically the the pressure head across the system will also increase with flow. So, eventually what, what happens is that see the pump is the prime mover right. So, the total pump head available is this one and that must be equal to the sum of the drop in pipes, drop in the valve plus drop in the system. So, as the drop in the valve, uh, uh, drop in the pipe and the drop in the uh, system rises, so there is less and less <coughs> delta p available across the valve and so the flow actually reduces, right. So, uh, so the operating points that are established will always have delta p falling. 
So, the valve differential pressure available actually falls quite sharply with uh, the flow. So, it is not constant. In effect, what happens is that <coughs> for example, this is the case of an equal percentage valve at some delta p. So, you see that the inherent characteristic is almost like a like an equal percentage nearly. On the other hand, if you put the valve that valve into along with a pipe and a pump and a system, then initially there is a lot of pressure delta p available because there is hardly any drop in the flow is low. So, there is hardly any drop in the system. So, so the pump, so the valve flow with change in lift because delta p available across the valve is, is now quite high at this stage. So, the, so there is a for a certain change in lift there is a good change in the flow. So, so the rate remains high. On the other hand here you see that in this part for the inherent characteristic the rate of uh, flow change is high, but that much rate of flow change is not achieved in the installed characteristic because of the fact that now the delta p has come down. So, if the delta p has come down then for a then for a given change <coughs> in the lift now so much change which was available see previously when delta p was held constant or uh, I mean a lot of change could be possible by changing a certain part of the lift, but now since the delta since the delta p is going to fall. So, therefore, so much change is is not possible and we get a different characteristic that characteristic is called the installed characteristic and this must be remembered because it is the installed characteristic finally, which is going to decide the decide the characteristic in the process control. So, therefore, <coughs> we must understand that the inherent characteristic gets changed because of pressure drops and the resulting characteristic is called the installed characteristic. So, the same thing happens for uh, linear valves again there is a high higher than inherent we are assuming that the inherent characteristic delta p will be will be maintained you know somewhere in the middle of the delta p range. So, initially you have high you have a higher delta p. So, therefore, the rate of rise is high later on the rate of rise is lower than the inherent characteristic this is what happens. Uh, this is the characteristic for an inherent characteristic for a this thing and they are not so much used. So, the installed characteristic is actually not drawn. <coughs> now, these characteristics sometimes you know especially when we are trying to design process control application the valve gain the valve gain also comes along with the process gain. So, if so when we want to decide the decide the controller gain then uh, sometimes it is it is desirable that we change the <coughs> that we change the valve characteristic to actually suit the requirements of the process. For example, as we shall see that we can we may like to 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 have that the valve process combination gain remains more or less flat over the operating region. This may be a requirement for designing a good good controller. So, so what I am trying to say is that from the you know there is there is an electronic controller from which output is, is actually going to the valve actuator. The valve stem is being moved by some mechanism called actuator as we shall see. So, this is going to the actuator. Now, between this controller and the actuator sometimes we can put some signal processing blocks which are for example, in this case this is a this is called a multiplier relay right, right. So, what we are achieving here is that the see the signal available at the A port is a multiplication of B to C port. So, suppose this is this is increased. So, immediately this will increase then then this will this will also increase and therefore, this will increase sh sharper. So, what happens is that if you if you if you change this linearly if, if that is if the if the input is changed in a linear fashion over time then the output will change in this fashion right. So, what happens is that effectively actually so so if you if, if you put this relay now then then what will happen is that a linear valve will start behaving like an equal percentage valve. So, what we what is what is 
what is the message is that by 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 putting such signal processing blocks we can change the valve characteristics i mean depending on the availability sometimes it, it may not be it may not be easy to locate a a, a valve of that appropriate characteristic on the market but by signal processing after the controller we can always change the valve characteristics right so now next we come to uh, the various kinds of actuators you know how to actuate the valve so we typically we have various kinds of actuators we have electro uh, electromagnetic actuator or solenoid actuators we have pneumatic actuators we have sometimes for large valves we have hydraulic actuators right so uh, we can we, we can also typically we can also have mechanical actuators also manual actuators so in this case we will we'll, we'll typically look at two actuators one is a solenoid actuator and the other is a pneumatic actuator so solenoid actuators have you know higher speeds they are lower ratings but but higher speeds because higher speeds because as we will see that the force on the actuator can be quickly controlled because it is and it is controlled by current so current can be driven pretty fast so therefore forces can be created very fast varying forces can be created and therefore the valve actuation becomes fast on the other hand for pneumatic uh, actuators the the force is created by you know by bringing pressurized air on to to work on a surface or a diaphragm so since there is some volume involved so there is certain amount of time required for that air to come and fill the chamber and then create the pressure on the diaphragm so pneumatic actuators are are always generally slower than than solenoid actuators so we have higher speed lower size because pneumatic actuators can be of quite high si uh, i mean of larger size because by just by increasing the diaphragm sometimes we can create a lot of pressure for even higher ratings we can use hydraulics so solenoid actuators are generally of lower size and often they are used as we will see they are often used in pilot stages of electro hydraulic valve so you have a big big controlled valve and you want to move the valve so see that that big electro hydraulic valve actually maybe controls the flow now to to move the valve also you need to create <coughs> you need to move the valve so you know you have a valve Uh, okay. This is the installed characteristics. Page up. just a moment yeah yeah so we are talking about solenoid actuators that they can be used in they can be used in pilot stages uh, and why this is creating a problem okay so uh, so right so what I, what i was saying is that the electro hydraulic valve pilot stages the solenoid valves are used and 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 uh, and this is a particular uh, construction of the solenoid valve so you see that this is the valve this is the plug this is the plug and this is the closed position shown so this is inlet and it's flowing through this and going through this is the flow of fluid there is a spring loading now this is here the stem is actually connected to a to a to a magnetic core which is called the plunger right and here you have a high current carrying high force creating coil so this is the this is this is the coil assembly 
solenoid coil housing okay uh, shading coil shading coil is used to you know guide the flux through the through the core so that the proper force is created and flux actually the force is created by the flux so one has to guide the flux so that an, an, an upward force is created so, and this is the movable core this is the tube through which the core moves these are the these are the connections so what happens is that in when the coil is de-energized then the spring will push and keep the valve closed right on the other hand when this will uh, when this will you see that if, if this is energized then the flux is flowing like this as shown and it is pulling the plunger up so when the pulling the plunger up then the spring is compressed and this opening is open and the fluid flows so this is the way a solenoid actuator will work this is on the other hand this is a particular pneumatic actuator so, so again same thing again you have a plug and you have these ports so what happens is that here by spring force this is this is this is a particular valve where you can close the valve by applying air in the normal position it will stay open so there are various kinds of valves as we shall see that if you if you apply energy or force they will close or if you apply energy or force they will be open they will open so in the previous case for opening the valve we needed to apply current in this case for closing the valve we need to apply air force so the air will enter here this is the diaphragm on which it will create a pressure so the pressure multiplied by the area of the diaphragm will give the force and this force we are going to push it down and close it right so this is this is the operation basic operation of a pneumatic valve so as we shall see that if you see see see, see the characteristics of this valve then <coughs> obviously there are as we said that there are forces acting on the plug because when the fluid is flowing out through the orifice it is actually pushing the plug up or down depending on the flow uh, profile so there is a so there are forces acting on the plug so what happens is that because of this this the plug the valve stem position percent uh, and the i mean diaphragm pressure see there are two things firstly diaphragm pressure to stem position so how much diaphragm pressure is required to create what stem position and then stem position to flow stem position to flow characteristic is is essentially guided by the construction of the valve and the applied delta p on the other hand the diaphragm pressure applied to stem position is is guided is essentially affected by how much force is actually acting on the uh, on the stem so when you have high plug forces then this stem position to diaphragm pressure characteristic gets shifted right so by applying and and what is what is controlled what is controlled from the controller is actually the the diaphragm pressure you know actually there is a there is a controlled air supply pneumatic source so what amount of pressure will be applied on the flow control valve diaphragm that is what is controlled so if the stem position diaphragm pressure so in open loop control we will you know there is there is some gain calculated so people will think that now okay so this is the flow so now i know the flow characteristic so therefore this much of stem position must be realized so for realizing this much of stem position i have to apply this much of diaphragm pressure so that much of output will come from the controller this is the way the valve is going to be controlled but it so happens that this stem position to diaphragm pressure characteristic will change depending on whether there is plug force or not so we depending on the plug force we may or may not be able to and the plug force depends on so many things the plug force depends on the current value of uh, pressure in the in, in the pipe so so we need to make it is necessary to make this make valves invariant to such variations of force so for it is for such purposes that we use often use what is known as a valve positioner so valve positioner is actually a itself a control system so what it does is the following so you see that in this case this is the this is this is the valve right this is the valve stem 
again there is a spring and this is the this is the diaphragm on which the pressure is being applied right. So, the diaphragm is coming from the air is coming from here and it is through this valve that the pressure the position of this spool position of this spool that the pressure here is being controlled right. So, how it is being controlled? So, we are applying a 3 to 15 psig input signal which is a low power input signal that is being that is being applied here in this chamber. So, that creates a force on this once it creates a force on this this pool will move downward. So, when it moves downward the air supply which is a high pressure air will flow through this and through this and will come here. So, depending on the opening there will be a there will be a kind of pressure drop and the final pressure will be realized here. Now, as this pressure increases this thing now starts moving downward and the valve opens. On the other hand because of this mechanism when this comes downward there is a force applied upward. So, you see it is a it is a it is a force balance principle. So, finally, whatever pressure is being applied here that must be balanced that will be that will be balanced by this that will be balanced by the spring force as well as this force. So, therefore, since this is an applied pressure and the and the spring force depends on the displacement. So, therefore, the the this for a for a given pressure here the the valve will as long as this force is not balanced say when when this force is higher then it will start opening and 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 this pressure will keep increasing as it is keep keeping increasing this is come trying to come down and therefore this is going to go up increasing the spring pressure so the spring pressure will will actually balance this force when a particular displacement of this spring takes place and by the mechanism this a particular displacement of this spring implies a particular displacement of this stem so therefore you, when you apply a particular pressure here a particular displacement of the stem is achieved irrespective of what are the forces here. So, till this displacement is achieved this will start moving and obviously this should have enough power to you know you know overcome this force. So, but if you have created enough power then just enough force will be created here. So, that the final displacement will actually balance this pressure. So, the final displacement is always invariant irrespective of whatever is the force on this uh, stem. So, in this way you achieve a particular stem position to control input signal it does not depend on the plug force right because by 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 closed loop control. So, such a thing is called a valve positioner there are various other mechanisms there is just one mechanism which we have shown there are various other flapper nozzles with based mechanisms etcetera. So, now we come to take a look at some valve characteristics for example, you know this this there are certain characteristics of the stem position movement especially dynamic characteristics right. So, if you give a small value of command this the stem position will be this much if you give a large command it will be this much, but you see there is a certain restriction on the rate at which the stem can travel right. So, Therefore, you can you cannot give very large and at the same time very high frequency commands. If you give them then that input command will not be realized in terms of stem position and you will get responses like this. So, for example, if you give a large and then high frequency sinusoid then the stem position will not be able to follow it, but rather it will go up like this. So, there will be a distortion you know. So, these things are to be these things are to be uh, kept in mind when one is designing a process control loop with a valve right that they have these uh, rate limits any actuator most of the electromechanical actuators actually have a rate limit. Similarly, there may be a there may there may be a there may be hysteresis in the stem position due to various factors you know. So, when when you are when you when you, when you are increasing the pressure the stem position may may actually follow this this curve and when you are decreasing the pressure it may not follow exactly the same curve. 
Now, such dead bands as we know from uh, you know standard nonlinear control systems often give rise to oscillations. So this you know these process control loops, flow loops, the if you if you if you give an if you give an alternating command, then the process control loop may actually oscillate. So these are called limit cycles in the closed loop. Similarly, these are sometimes you know there is there is a very important quantity for a valve called a rangeability. So rangeability means that what is the maximum to minimum uh, flow ratio. So the maximum flow to the minimum controllable flow is it is said. So valves can have you know some sometimes valve manufacturers claim that they have you know 10 is to 1, 15 is to 1, 13 is to 1. Uh, 30 is to 1 kind of you know range abilities. So sometimes in some applications it may happen that you need a very high range ability that is you, you can sometimes need very very small flows, sometimes you need very high, very high flows. So in such applications you sometimes have to you know have valve sequencing that is you actually have more than one valve and in one part of the operating region you operate one valve. And in another part of the operating region, you operate another valve, but you have to ensure you know certain things like you know transitions, uh, such that suddenly the the when you when you when you when you move from one valve to another valve, the process control uh, loop characteristics do not change. So one of these is by you know split range control, which we have also seen in the case of our process control module. So you have two valves, and they are they are fed through an amplifier and a bias, right? So, in so, so the, these biases are made different, and in certain parts of the region, the the actually the control signal comes to this valve. So, this valve will will operate. Then, after some time, when this valve input will actually saturate, then this valve will operate no longer, and then this valve will start operating. So, this so so the overall range of operation is split using this gain and bias uh, mechanisms and in different parts of the operating region different valves are uh, different valves are employed. Similarly, sometimes you can have there may be another scheme this is another valve sequencing scheme where you have a pressure sensor. You know, so this pressure, this is actually the controller output, which is which is which is going to the valve actuator. So when the controller output, so the here this the the switching, which is by these three-way valves, is actually done based on how much how much controller output is being exerted to these valves, and depending on them, one of the valves will be operating. Either this will be operating, or this will be shut off, or this will be vented and this will be operating. So and it turns out that for such sequencing you know when you when you will for example typically the gain of large valves will be actually larger than the gain of small valves. So one has to ensure that the when you are switching from the small valve to the large valve the gain is not the gains are uh, the gains do not suddenly change because that is going to change the overall gain of the process control loop and may bring in you know things like uh, instability problems, instability or saturation problems. So for doing that that is why it is for such kind of sequencings equal percentage valves are actually better suited because as we know from the equal percentage characteristics the equal percentage characteristic is like this right same position to flow. So you see that for the small valve when you when you when you are just just before closing the small valve the actually small valve actually has a very high gain. So when you are switching on from this gain to the gain of the large valve, so, so, so the large valve actually has a high value of gain, but it is operating in its low, low gain region. So we are transforming from the high gain region of the small valve characteristic to the low gain region of the large valve characteristic. So therefore the gain switching, the suddenly when you switch from the small valve to the large valve, the overall process loop gain does not suddenly change. So this is one re reason why you know uh, equal percentage valves are better suited for valve sequencing rather than linear valves.
often as we have seen that uh, as we know I mean this is this shows that uh, often you know valves are valves are actually put in the closed loop. So, it is actually a part of the flow control loop generally and if you have a <coughs> that is rather than suppose you have a temperature loop. So, in the temperature loop output controller output rather than giving directly to the valve which has non-linearities, which has dead bands, which has hitch stresses as we have seen. It is better to set up a flow control loop which is a slave loop in the sense that the, the, the temperature control loop is actually the master control loop. So, the temperature controller output will give a flow set point as we have seen in the case of cascade. So, what, ha what will happen is that so, if you if you can if you set up so, so, so this is the, the this is the one coming from the master say temperature control loop. Then if you set up this is, this is the flow controller this is the this is the flow transmitter. So, if you set up then even if the valve is nonlinear, the characteristic of this loop that is between this point and this point are much more linear let us say it may, it may not be absolutely linear in a mathematical sense, but they will be much more linear and that makes it much easier to actually design the design and ensure that the characteristic of the uh, temperature control loop remains uniformly good over the over the whole region of operation. So, sometimes may, many times we set up this kind of loops. Sometimes you know valve characteristics can be very cleverly used to you know match the match the system characteristics. So, for example, take the case of a liquid to liquid heat exchanger. So, what happens is that now you know this is the input which is the cooling flow and what is the output? The output is the outgoing temperature of the liquid which is being heated let us say. So, when there is a slow flow rate that is when this flow rate is low then obviously, this liquid stays within the tube for a longer time and therefore, for both the both both the gain between this point to this point there is a temperature for a for a for a given rate of flow of the heating liquid the increase in temperature between the inlet and the outlet will be higher not only that this will be also the the delay between if you make a step here then this then this will go up but the delay between this step and this step will also be higher because of the fact that the uh, that the liquid is traveling slowly so, but on, on, on the other hand when you are when you are so you see that this is this is a situation where you have high gain and you have a high delay. So, you need to keep as we know that the controller gain needs to be kept low in this region. On the other hand if this flow is increased if this flow rate is increased then the gain will fall and the delay will also fall. So, now is the case when you can have a you can for 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 better improved transient performance you can have a higher controller gain, but it is not you know automatically easy to actually change controllers. So, for this application if you use if one uses a an equal percentage valve then as we know that the valve gain goes up as the flow rate goes up. So, so automatically the the loop gain increases as the flow rate increases. So, the so, so the so the overall process uh, loop transient characteristic is maintained uniform simply by the valve character sim simply by the choice of the valve right. So, this is what I am saying similarly at the and 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 an opposite situation can occur uh, if you have an orifice meter. So, in a, so in an orifice meter as the flow rate increases the the sensor gain also increases. So, again the loop gain increases. So, in so in such a case the the one has to have the overall gain reducing right. So, one can use a linear valve for this. The lastly you know valves are one has to put a have a view towards what will happen if the actuation fails because you know sometimes this this flows can actually uh, cause explosions etcetera. So, valves are, are constructed in various configurations which are shown here for example, fail open or air to close. So, if this air supply somehow fails then then this then this valve will will fail and it will fail in an in an in an open situation. So, the if the air supply is not there then the valve will remain open. Similarly, there are air to open valves where if if, if the if the air supply closes 
fails, then the valve will close. So these, so you one has to choose a particular actuation configuration to, to you know, uh, avert uh, industrial accidents under various kinds of failures. So that brings us to the end of this lecture. So as a matter of review, we have typically seen globe ball, uh, ball and butterfly valves. We have seen various kinds of valve flow characteristics, both static and dynamic. And we have seen how valves are, are, are actuated and controlled. There is one aspect which is treated in books, uh, which is called valve sizing. That is for a given application determining the, 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 the size of the valve. We have, we are not uh, talking about that because this is essentially a process design exercise and not does not concern automation and control. So to end points to ponder first is sketch the cross section of a globe valve and indicate four of its major parts. You should be able to do that. What is the difference between installed and inherent characteristics? This is extremely important and, and, and why this occurs. What is the main advantage of a valve positioner? Why, why one puts it? And finally, mention one advantage of a solenoid actuator over a pneumatic actuator and one advantage of a pneumatic actuator over a solenoid actuator. So that brings us to the end of the lecture. Thank you very much. Welcome to today's lecture, which is, lec which is lesson number 26 of the course on industrial automation and control. Today we are going to take our first look at hydraulic control systems and we will review some elementary basic concepts and then we will first look at the components which make a hydraulic control systems. In the subsequent lectures we shall see some special components and we shall see as to how these components can be used to make a hydraulic control system. So we, give, so we begin here, before we begin we look at the instructional objectives. So the instructional objectives are basically to describe the principle of, principles of operation of hydraulic systems and understand its advantages, what is involved and why it is uh, almost irreplaceably used in certain applications, there are certain advantages. Then uh, of course we have to be, the main purpose of the lesson is to be familiar with the basic hydraulic system components and their roles in the system, what they do and describe the constructional and functional aspects of hydraulic pumps and motors, how they function. And be familiar with directional valves and control valves. They are very important components. 